And just before I hand over to our speaker for today, I'd like to introduce Ella to you. Um, Ella Kurtz is a midwife and a PhD candidate from Canberra in Australia. Her particular areas of interest are the power dynamics of maternity care provision and women's rights at birth. And one of our, uh, one of our committee, Deborah Davis, is one of her supervisors. Um, so without further ado, let me hand over to Ella. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for being the session. It's nice to have you all here. Um, it's nice to see that some of you are part of practice in lives. And um, I'll be interested to um, look at your questions. Um, as I'm going along, please feel free to ask anything at any time or try to feel free to do the that. Or even if you just relate to anything and you get things or things like that, please um, feel free to. Oh, I'm just saying that the sound's not great. Let me just adjust that. Oh. Okay, let's try this. Can anybody, how's this sounding, everyone? A little bit clearer or still not loud enough? Much better. I'll do a little bit more testing. Much better. Okay, let me know how that's going. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, I wanted to tell you a little bit about me um, and the motivation for this presentation to start out with. Um, thanks, Chris, for introducing me. So, yes, I am a midwife and I'm a PhD student now. And um, my supervisor, Deb Davis, is here in our virtual room. Say hi. <laughs> um, and just over a year ago, I gave birth to my second child at home. My interest in home birth grew out of my work as a midwife as I began to see how the mainstream systems a lot of women in Australia have their babies in really seemed to hinder the physiology of birth. Then, um, just recently when I experienced home birth myself, I gained a very personal understanding of um, what a good option home birth can be for women. So that's another story. So for this piece of research for my PhD, I wanted to explore uh, why so many people in Australia seem to be against home birth or maybe just uncomfortable with the idea of it, even more research on the area shows home birth to be quite a good maternity care option for women for a number of reasons. I thought looking at the media might be a good approach to understand uh, what people think about home birth and why, because I have noticed that um, the media gave a lot of attention to any home birth fatality and described home birth in a really negative way around those any incidences of fatality. But at the same time, I didn't really notice any media reporting or perhaps very little um, minimal uh, media coverage of hospital fatality, even though I was sure that the numbers for hospital fatality in childbirth were likely to be a lot bigger than home birth fatality seeing as the home birth rate in Australia is less than 1%. Um, so just from numbers alone, there would have to be more hospital fertility at childbirth than um, in home birth. So first to the research, um, home birth for low-risk women attended by constant midwives who are networked within response and maternity care services is a viable option with good outcomes for women and their babies. I guess it's important to note that um, a lot of evidence that we have uh, talks about the physical safety of home for women and babies at home birth. Um, yes, that's right, Sheila. Um, and so these studies are trying to show that the physical safety for both mothers and baby is equal to the physical safety um, of those women and babies in the hospital, um, especially for the low risk population, as she was pointing out there. Um, but that home birth can actually be quite protective and perhaps one could argue even safer for women in terms of emotional safety than hospital birth. Um, but yet, yeah, in this um, media analysis, I'm focusing on safety as a, as a physical outcome that's not an baby open being staying alive. 
So even though this research says that home birth is a viable option, um, home birth often evokes very emotional responses. And there's a cultural belief that home birth contributes to a damaged or dead baby. So that remains a really widely held view, which continues to drive the anti-home birth debate. Uh, an Australian midwife and scholar, Hannah Darwin, suggests in one of her articles that more research about the benefits of home birth won't end the home birth debate because the polarisation the debate produces is too powerful. So in a maternity care world in which evidence-based practice is more natural, this idea is really interesting to me because it really seems to shine a light on um, I guess the space between the evidence, or which is in this case based on our scientific understanding of birth and how birth works, and our belief. Um, and that's up theorists who say that people often form ideas based, or more, perhaps I should say more easily form ideas based on emotion rather than facts and logic. So on to our next slide. Yeah. So you might be interested in what the SACS in Australia are. That was the first thing I thought I should look into starting out um, on this media analysis because I didn't really know what they might be. And I discovered we don't have a precise measure um, or comparison at this stage in Australia, although an Australian birthplace study is underway, which will mimic the UK birthplace study. Um, what we do know at this stage is that the instance of home birth mortality um, is collected but not released because the instance is so low that individuals could be identified in the data. So they're not able to release it. Um, and also from some retrospective studies um, in 2013, 2014, that there's no statistically significant um, difference in stillbirth and early neonatal deaths between birth and giving birth in hospital or at home. So I guess it's good to think about um, thinking about what the research does say about home is why even are we giving birth in hospital? Um, it was probably it's such an assumption many of us take for granted we don't even think about why that's the practice that we currently use. Um, and some there's some thought that hospital birth would introduce to aid the learning opportunities for healthcare providers that were training. Um, just looking at your current handcuffs. Yes, that is definitely a big issue here in data collection. Um, and I've read a few interesting articles that kind of work on the premise that, you know, when we're trying to get good steps around home birth, it's really hard to measure that because it's kind of comparing oranges with apples. Um, if, yeah, if it's hard to track exactly um, how the home birth is carried out, how planned it is, and what kind of um, backup and skill retention it has there. So, yeah, that's a really important point in thinking about the statistics. Um, yeah, so the idea was that the hospital perhaps was introduced to a learning opportunities for training um, so that healthcare providers were, were more easily in a position to learn. There was a group of women in the hospital at the same time and that aided um, healthcare providers' training. And it might come as a surprise to you, or perhaps you know this already, it came as a surprise to me to learn that early hospital perinatal mortality rates were really high, um, which was due mainly to infrequent forceps used and also the spread of purple fever between women because of practitioner ignorance around germ transmission, like hand washing practices and the use of unsterilized equipment. But around at this time, women were held responsible for bringing the fever into the hospital with them rather than catching it in the hospital. And the idea that hospitals increased perinatal deaths didn't enter wider cultural ideology or mindset. The relocation did coincide with a general advancement in population health outcomes um, and life expectancy. 
the advancements which at the time were likely um, due, thought to be due to innovation, I guess you could say, from the medical profession. Um, but today we understand that it probably wasn't the, the medical improvement that um, helped these outcomes, improve these outcomes, but um, non-medical improvements like great access to food or housing um, and sanitation, which were probably more effective in combating the poor health outcomes associated with that period of time. Okay. Oh wow, that's very interesting. Interesting point. Thanks for that, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are just a couple of um, the kind of cultural beliefs which underpin this common assumption we have in Australia that school is the best place to have a baby um, because it's the safest place to have a baby. Which yeah, I think most of the is a very strong hold by most people. <laughs> um, so in order to get some information out of the media articles to um, kind of see what they were constructing, I guess you could say, about home birth, um, I used critical discourse analysis. There's a little bit of information about that methodology there on the screen if you haven't heard of it or encountered it very much before. Um, because it, it was a good methodology to use because as a vehicle for a cultural belief, the media reflect but also create cultural norms of birth or of everything but in this case birth. And um, this is done through the way words are used and how they portray events, how they tap into ideologies, cultural mindset and ideas that we have about the way the world works. Um, so probably especially in this area, which I, as I mentioned before, um, evokes a very emotional response in people, the media is really able to contribute to and promote a particular way of doing birth as normal and common sense and other ways as wrong. So as I started looking into media articles, I uh, discovered that there had been one one woman had died. In, this is this is just in Australia, by the way, just in the articles in Australia. Um, and so, one woman had died at a home birth in 2012. That was the only um, maternal mortality um, in 30 years. So there hasn't been anything then, but for 30 years before then too. Um, so actually, I, I um, chose this year to search for media articles because I was really interested to see um, what would come through in the media and how the media would handle this and how they would report it. Um, after a little bit of deliberation with my supervisors, we decided to find articles through a Google search. So we found the news articles through Google rather than um, university database or online newspaper databases um, in order to get kind of a, a rough sketch or yeah, a rough outline of what the general Australian population might be reading about home birth. Um, so I had two search terms. The first was home birth death Australia 2012 and the second hospital death Australia 2012. And um, down the screen is a little bit of information. Um, about what came out of that search. So I want to um, run through um, the main themes that came out um, when I was coding these articles that came out of the search. Um, so the first thing that uh, was just seemed to saturate all the articles um, was the criminalisation of home birth, but it, um, it's really something illegal. So this was done in a few ways of the language. Just to give you an example, home birth was described as a major crime, a criminal offence, and um, midwives 
who were deregistered but who perhaps still practice or well, that's a bit of a murky area um, in the way it was reported, but they were described as escaping the law and that was seen to be, I guess, immoral. Um, mostly it was the health professionals, so the midwives, and um, nearly all of these articles by one were about an independent midwife, not um, home birth funding, a publicly funded home birth model. So it was the independent midwife who was targeted um, and described as breaking the law. So the woman and all her family wasn't really um, described as being more breaks and straight, but there's other stuff that women come to later. Um, yeah, so these midwives, I guess, were described as a really renegade and outside of the law. Um, in contrast, hospital mortality was described differently. This is how it was sad and unfortunate and an incident to learn from. So something that um, you could take note of what happened to improve hospital processes. For example, communication between doctors or uh, not, I think it was one of the doctors, but whoever staff were around that needed to be improving communication or systems or that kind of thing. So it was kind of um, not uh, an individual attack on any care provider. And yeah, we're seeing something that needed to be improved next time rather than anything. So the next thing that came up was um, the midwife being seen as, um, I guess, a bad person. <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess, or oh, maybe a little bit synonymous with being a witch. Maybe that's like a, has some more positive connotations as well. Um, so she was kind of delegitimized um, in a, a number of attacks to her personhood and profession. Just being a financial. Um, well, that's a good question. Who was driving the criminalization message? I I guess in these media articles, you know, it is one reporter that takes an angle on what they want to say about whatever incident has happened. Um, I guess a lot of though that was that came through was what coroners had said, so the legal system, um, and that came quite strongly in a lot of articles that the coroner said this, the coroner said that. So yeah, I guess reflecting those legal systems. Sometimes doctors, they, maybe they didn't say criminal as much, but they would say that, um, yeah, like in their opinion, the midwife had been practicing in their own way or, yeah, leading to this um, idea that the midwife was ignorant, which is part of this character assassination actually. Um, yes, so there was there were character flaws ascribed to home birth midwives. Um, I have a couple of examples here. Um, in one text, a midwife is kind of almost presented as having a dangerous power over a woman. The husband describes, this is later, um, that his wife was brainwashed into having a, a birth at home by the midwife who insisted it was safe. And also, Apparently, this woman was heard to have pleaded for help before her death. Um, in this article, implying that the midwife wouldn't help her in her final moments, which I think paints a very strong and emotive scene. Um, so that was kind of the midwife being dangerous, I guess. Also, the midwives were the way they were described. They were made to seem like they were incompetent or ignorant. Um, so, for example, that they committed a horrifying catalogue of errors, or that the care they provided fell significantly short of the standard expected, or that um, they needed a greater level of assistance to properly manage the complications. Um, and actually, in a kind of a colonial setting, one midwife um, makes a like just describes why she has um, practiced in a certain way, using some evidence to say this is why she. She practiced in this particular way, despiting some evidence. And um, the coroner, I guess, doesn't agree with her opinion. And so, describes in this situation, describes her views on birth as idiosyncratic and rejects part of the evidence she puts forward to support her claims. Um, yes, um, so in contrast, there isn't that 
um, character assassination for hospital death. Um, so a little bit similar to the last slide that I showed you, they were attributed to unfortunate circumstances. Um, and yeah, we just found that should have been better communication. Okay, so here's then um, how the women were presented. So I guess um, some of the ways women were described was tapping into the kind of cultural values that we have around women. Um, kind of status quo, gendered stereotypes, women as emotional or not quite rational were drawn on to, I guess, undermine why women's decisions around birth, but why they had chosen this option. Um, the main one was that they weren't well educated, or they weren't educated enough, which I guess, you know, we probably in this room, we know that's probably not true, that a lot of women that were just home birth would actually know a lot about home birth and um, have done extra research about it to back up the decision in a, in a society that isn't comfortable with home birth. Um, but yeah, that was really presented that women didn't know and that they they should have sought outside medical advice, um, but they needed better education. And yeah, that if they had known more, they would have chosen a different option, which could be true for some women, but I'm sure it isn't true for all of them. Um, and then I guess taking into kind of another idea about femininity. So I guess there was um a way to describe women's choice for home birth that women were choosing it in a kind of a frivolous way. So their desire to, for example, birth their baby gently was entered in quotes to make that kind of thing absurd and frivolous. Um, and another woman who describes why she chooses home birth is to avoid unsafe elements of hospital birth practice um, is a little line is written about saying many women opt for home births because they prefer a relaxed, familiar environment and would rather avoid a hospital visit, as though, you know, it's just inconvenient for a woman to go to the hospital rather than that she's making a very strong choice for her. But yes, I agree, that's not my passion. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are these kind of approaches to, I guess, Illegitimize a woman's choice for home birth. Um, yes, this is one of my favourite lines in an article actually, where the, it was written We contend that the choice to have a really lovely, spontaneous birth at home, which is written in quotation marks that part, um, is only justified if it exposes the future charge to zero risk of avoidable disability, and this is just not the case. Uh, another theme that came out was the assumption that death can be prevented in hospital. That was really an overwhelming theme um, and came through most of the articles, um, in the, the home birth articles, that if this baby had been born in hospital, the death could have been prevented. Um, that the baby would have survived in the healthy state. Um, in contrast, when it came to a hospital death, in one text, the coroner said uh, the woman should have been able to deliver safe at the regional hospital. Ultimately, I'm unable to determine whether the baby would have survived if she had been delivered earlier, which is just very in contrast to the way all of the home birth deaths were described as definitely preventable if they had been in the hospital, managed in the hospital. Um, I just thought interesting to include here. One mother whose baby did die at their home birth, um, a little snippet of her, what she says comes through in one text. And she, she says, meconium aspiration would have happened no matter where the birth took place, and there would not have been an investigation had it taken place in the hospital. So I guess that's feeding into the idea of what I was finding in the media analysis that. Um, yeah, she's kind of questioning the dominant assumption that hospital birth can prevent every new problem. Yeah. Saying that maybe some of that maybe could die regardless. Unfortunately. So I guess um, this is uh, the last thing 
and a kind of a little bit of all the other things that we've heard of leading to this thing. Um, and this kind of is the assumption that death is preventable in hospital is matched by the assumption that home birth is inherently risky. So that was kind of coming from all of the other themes. Um, but that it's reported in the media that um, home birth isn't safe, which doesn't really reflect what we know the research to say at all, but uh, that, that did, doesn't make it into the articles, into any of these articles that I, I saw. Um, so for example, the safety of home birth is a subject of frequent debate and many experts have called for a ban on the birthing technique. So that line that was in one of the texts, that um, I guess that is true that it's often a frequent debate, but it kind of suggests that there isn't any positive research about home birth, even though you know that there is a, a good body to support it. Um, all kind of taking the tone that women who give birth by out, birth outside of hospital, outside of a clinical setting. Um, always put themselves in any forms at risk. It's a kind of a blanket statement. Um, another text urged professionals to encourage women to deliver in a safe clinical setting and also practice safe and comfortable obstetrics. Um, yeah, once again, all those things feeding into this idea that um, birth at home is risky. So by looking very carefully at the way the media presents childbirth, uh, or, um, childbirth fatality, death set in childbirth, um, both at home and in hospital for this analysis, they've been very careful about thinking about which words were chosen and um, what they created, why they were chosen and what values they were tapping into. Um, as well as noticing this real absence of um, what the science is about home birth in, in the media representation. Um, I started to think that the debate wasn't, perhaps it wasn't just about the place of birth, it wasn't just hospital or home, um, but more about kind of deeper things going on. Um, and that maybe that maternity care providers who work outside the hospital, so thinking about these independent midwives, who most of these articles described, um, very much threaten mainstream options of maternity care um, just by just by existing, just by being there. They're suggesting that there is also another version of maternity care possible. Um, and I guess for any of us who I do have the assumption or the value that hospital is the one right place to give birth, you know, the one right maternity care. Um, uh, this existence of another option um, can be uncomfortable and threatening because it does kind of force us to, to think something about what we think about maternity care rather than just being able to proceed with the assumption that we would like to have about it. Um, so I guess it, in a way it's easy for us to, um, to maintain our grip on our own reality by just shutting that other option out and rejecting it and saying that it's wrong, which I think is really what's happening um, in this kind of debate, that um, the one side is really just rejecting the other side right out because it's kind of uncomfortable and threatening and questioning things that um, people would rather not have questions about their values and ideologies. There's more going on too, but that came up in a lot. Um, anything else? Um, yeah, so these were a few things that I wanted to leave you with to recap. Um, so take a moment to read them. I guess. Yeah, the analysis made me think more about um, how our maternity care is probably based um, often on emotive thinking rather than scientific evidence, even though 
we don't hold that to be the case if you ask people. I'm sure people would say that it was based on scientific evidence. Um, yes, so was there any questions anybody had about anything or more? similar experience you noticed things these kind of things happening for yourself or um, yeah. By the way, I do want to say too, you probably noticed that I have some um, references throughout and I haven't included them on here, but if anybody's interested in seeing any of those, um, hey, that in mind, I can get them to you if any particular area anyone's interested in. Thank you, Ella. That was a, that was a, that was a really interesting insight into, into the research you've been doing and um, uh, opened my eyes and uh, about quite a lot as well, especially as I have a young grandson and my daughter is going to have a, uh, a baby at the end of the year. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So has anyone got any Nothing. questions for Ella? Um, if you have, then uh, please put your hand up. That's a great question, Sarah. <laughs> yes, and I wish that I had a good answer for that. Um, maybe someone in this room will have a good idea. I guess talking about it is good, but sometimes I find it hard to even talk about it. I feel like in this room, probably everyone's very receptive to hearing this information, but it can be hard to talk about it if people really have a different mindset. I'm interested to hear what everyone else thinks about how we can change these kind of cultural ideas. I'm just reading your comment, Lingo. Yes, I all um, just want to point about um, different between Australia and New Zealand. I haven't worked in New Zealand as my wife, I've been on a holiday. Um, but I always hear, like, I do always have a friend that's really more progressive than Australia in these ways. But, uh, Deb, you might have some interesting insights into that about the way they structure their, their, the legal side of things. That's right. Um, yeah. Sorry, Ella. I was just going to say um, they do have a different um, compensation scheme there, which is a no fault kind of compensation scheme. But I don't think that's at the bottom of the differences. I think um, they're much more um, uh, behind choice, informed choice as a as an ocean, and um, and the the where you have your baby because it's funded by the government, whether it's home or hospital, there's less kind of emotion in it it's a sanctioned choice to have your baby you know a government sanctioned choice to have your baby at home i think that government sanctioning is very important isn't it and i can see that even whilst in canberra because we now have publicly funded work which has not been highly taken up but it is sanctioned by the government which makes it yeah it's almost beyond the reproaches that these independent lives are facing in some strange way you know, actually it's written Oh, that's really a pretty to hear that. So, Karen, do you think that um, why is there midwife shortages at the moment, or is that just an ever-present kind of thing? And Sheila, going to your comment too, I think you're really right that um, it does show who has the power to define terms, and I guess when you find yourself on the other side of that power, it's not always that nice. Um, I remember working at um, a UK midwife, I can't think of her name right now, unfortunately. I saw her at a conference, presenting at a conference in Australia. She came to visit. That was when um, Julia Gillard was Prime Minister. And I guess probably for any Australians who remember that she always received a lot of negativity in the media. Um, just, I guess, don't even know how to summarise, but just the way she walked or the way she said things or what she, everything she did was wrong. And this UK midwife was saying that she thought compared to the UK, Australia was really behind in accepting women in positions of power, which I guess maybe relates to home birth too, because that's very much, yeah, a woman, woman's choice for power in the private sphere. Between those things, yeah. Yes, I think that's interesting, Chris, about the um, 
cultural differences. I think that probably goes into a lot. Also, not many private opticians in New Zealand. I didn't know that. Is that how? Why is that? Because we seem to have so many in Australia. <laughs> oh, and the UK too. Hmm. Also, it, oh, it doesn't feel good to be compared to the US. It's sorry for anyone from the US here, but. <laughs> I'll say only, okay, not many at all. Mm. Yeah, I guess what you're showing in the, the chat is that there is so many things that go into this kind of cultural framing, isn't there? So being free or, yeah, there's so many different factors. Oh, wow, that's great, Lyndall. So there's a lot of independent life there. 90-ish, wow. 90-ish independent midwives in Wellington, did you say? Yeah. I think, Avril, that seems really ahead of the game too, that private health insurance isn't a big thing in New Zealand. And I feel like in Australia, people really are interested in health insurance. And I can't really understand why, but so it does seem like you often get a better deal in the public system. Yes, and that's right, Deb. So private doctors, yeah, if they have something at stake, they'll lose money like they. So it's in their best interest to um, to kind of delegitimise private members, of course. What do you What do you mean with your comment, Karen? That um, is that just that midwives need to practice in kind of a a midwifey way rather than a medical way, or something else that you're getting into? That we have midwives need to really recognise the physiology of birth. And Chris, actually, I wonder if in the UK, just thinking about what this midwife said, I wonder if, I don't know if you had a lot of contact with home birth, but yeah, if you feel like just generally on the streets, even or people that you meet, if you feel like people are more comfortable with home birth than they are here. Yes, that's right, home birth is physiological birthing. Yeah, which I think is a really great part of home birth, that it does have so much scope for physiology. It really doesn't yeah, allow that to happen, I think, probably better than most hospitals. I'm trying to think of birth centers as physiological birthing, so I think they do better, but I think home birth does it the best. Yeah, Chris, so that's Yes, that does sound good when you just bring that up a bit on them. Yes, so maybe um, in terms of journalists and networking, it would be good if someone really um, can, yeah, brought kind of a campaign together to get some more positive birth stories around. I know that free birth is a, a really big issue that we're facing in Australia now because it's very hard to get private home birth access. Um, yes, and it's a vulnerable position to be, isn't it? If you feel like birth in the hospital just won't work for you and there's no one else to cover you. Yeah, that's a good point, Sheila. And I think just speaking for us in Canberra here, as maybe you haven't mentioned, we now have a publicly funded model of home birth running through our birth centre. And um, there hasn't been significant uptake at all, which is a little bit worrying in case then um, the powers that be, for me it's a little bit worrying in case the powers that be decide, oh, well, we don't, women don't want that. But I think you're right that if people are, if women, there's kind of that culture of fear around birth, which I think we do have, then of course home birth isn't going to seem like a good option. Or it takes time to talk about those things, doesn't it? And maybe it takes longer than nine months for women to hear new information about birth and what they can do. And you're so yeah, so right. Hmm, that's interesting about women in New Zealand too. Yeah, I just always get the feeling that New Zealand's like a lot more progressive in terms of everything <laughs> culturally. In terms of inclusion and equality, and yes, they wouldn't leave their refugees anywhere. I would take them. (laughs) 
Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, just in our last few minutes left, yeah, any more pressing things anybody wants to talk about or had questions about? Oh, that's interesting, Carol. Um, just reading more things. Oh, that's it. Yes, Thank yes. you, Carol, for that. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's true. I've always had lots of geography to work in Australia. Thank you, everyone, for coming here to the video. And thanks for your um, interesting discussion points. Um, well, I'm actually not sure if we will publish this one um, at this stage. <laughs> What's your timetable, Ella? What was that, please, sir? So what's your time? When, when are you hoping to complete your, your PhD? Well, I guess from the middle of the year, um, I'm doing it part-time, so I can only have two more years part-time. Okay. Yeah. It's already been I guess, four years or so, yeah. Um, so even though it's still two more years, it feels like it's getting to the end of things. Thanks well, I just like. <laughs> I'd just like to echo what everyone else has said, which is just to say thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation and obviously um, really engaging, judging by the level and, and quality of the questions. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Love those videos.